So let me ask you a question. You ready? Why is it that significant people in your life can so often disappoint you? Anybody? Don't raise your hand. You know, don't look at him or her. (laughs) But why is it that that can be something we deal with? It's just sort of expected that that significant person is destined to disappoint us, or that situation is just more than likely going to end up in failure. Would you do your hand like this? You know what this is right here? This, this is an expression of our heart, but a heart thirst. So, if I'm taking my thirsty heart over to this one right here, sure, that, that would be the pastor's wife, Shirley, right there, but I'm, I'm, I'm taking my heart, my thirsty heart over to her, which I have done on numerous occasions, saying, I'm thirsty and I need you to fill my cup. I, I need you to satisfy my thirst. I, I, we kind of lost count of how many years of marriage we have. We just kind of go with decades now. <laughs> but after the 40-something years of marriage and she sees me coming home from church after I've, you know, hollered at you all for two hours and sweated and spit and stomped and there ain't nothing left. And I get in the tundra and I drive to the house and she sees me coming holding <laughs> holding my little cup. I promise you, after lo these many years, there have been times when she would just, as she saw me come through the door, do this. I can't help you. <laughs> I can't help you. Because the thirst that's in my soul, the thirst for significance, the thirst to not be rejected, the thirst for the assurance that you're not a failure, that thirst inside us is so big that there is only one person in the universe who can satisfy that thirst, and his name is not Shirley. And his name is not your spouse. And his name is not the name of a corporation. Jesus stood up on the last day, John chapter 7, you can go ahead and turn there. Stood up on the last day, the great day of the feast. And this, this person who was crying out was God now in a human body with lips with vocal cords, with gesturing arms, standing, and it says he cried out, if anybody is still thirsty, you come to me and drink. As he spoke, John would say of the Holy Spirit who would be given to those who would believe in Jesus, but that hadn't happened yet because Jesus had not been glorified. He would go to the cross, he would be buried, he would be raised again on the third day, he would be re-exalted with all the glory that he had before he left the Father, and then some, and from that place his Spirit would be poured out. And it would be the Spirit of the exalted Jesus, he said, if anyone believes in me, is believing in me, coming to me with your thirst and believing in me out of that one's innermost being will flow what? Say it. Rivers of living water. And I just got to tell you, folks, he wasn't dealing in some academic theological concept. 
He was speaking in terms that he expected us to understand. We would feel it. We would feel the satisfying flow of rivers of living water. So who are you taking or what are you taking your thirsty heart to? Marriages can be built out of two thirsty hearts trying to get their thirst satisfied from each other. Two ticks and no dog. I know that sounds gross. Some marriages, oh, you can satisfy me. I'll marry you because you'll, you'll satisfy me. Uh, I'll, I'll marry this one because I can satisfy him or her. If we, don't, if we don't get this figured out, that the thirst that God created inside us, He caused it to be like this. The thirst would be for Him and what He alone can do that's bigger than what any person or any group of people or any setting or circumstance can ever do. Come to me and drink. What happens is that, that we, we can end up, even as believers, we've got marked up Bibles and we've got all kinds of discipleship groups and studies we've been through, but, but we're still walking around with our thirsty heart and trying to say to this person, satisfy this thirst, or this one satisfy this thirst. And we, 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 we end up developing this sense, nobody significant in my life is not going to disappoint me. Now, here's a radical statement, and I would just dare you to let it in. The problem is not necessarily those people who have disappointed you. You are the problem, and I am the problem. If I'm taking something that only God can satisfy to a person who isn't God and expect them to be something that they were never created to be. I've told you that about Shirley and me. Some of you would have to just say, you know, I mean, I, I, I live with the disappointment in my husband, tell you the truth. <laughs> don't say that. Don't poke him. Don't do that. I live with the, disapp live with the disappointment of my wife. I live why, why, why could that be? What if it is that there is a thirst in you so great to be free of the fear of rejection as a man. Maybe your earthly father rejected you. Maybe circumstances happened to where there was just rejection, and you, you, you have this huge place inside of you. I want somebody to tell me and keep telling me that I'm okay, that I'm accepted, that I'm not rejected, that I'm not a failure. People who love us are able to do that for a season and in certain ways. But my brother or my sister, if that is a God-shaped vacuum in you, your thirst will never be satisfied until you quit taking this little wad of a bowl called your thirsty heart and you quit taking it to people and you take it to Jesus. You take it to Him. Let me show you another related verse, passage. This is in the book of Jeremiah. The nation the nation of Israel, God's chosen people in that day, had strayed far away from Him. And one of the ways that they manifested their straying 
was that they turned away from the Lord and honoring him, and they started picking up these trinket idols, these false gods in the nations around them, and they started trying to worship them, trying to get their hearts satisfied from them. Idolatry is an attempt to get something other than the Lord to satisfy you, okay? We, we, we say, oh, I would never be guilty of idolatry. We wouldn't be guilty of bowing down before a statue. But you can have a two-legged idol, one that can talk back to you, one that can so forth. But so, so listen, to, listen to what Jeremiah speaks on behalf of the Lord. The Lord is speaking, verse 9, Jeremiah 2, therefore I will yet contend with you, the Lord says, declares the Lord. And with your sons' sons I will contend. Verse 11, has a nation changed gods when they were not gods? These gods, so-called gods that they changed out for were not gods at all. But my people have changed their glory for that which does not profit. They've gone to things that cannot satisfy them, cannot profit them when they didn't have to. Verse 13, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, to hew for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. Consequently, they live disappointed in their systems. What they're going for, for drink, for water, for satisfaction, continues to disappoint them because it has not, they have not within themselves, these cisterns, the ability to satisfy. They can't even hold the water, much less produce water. Verse 17, have you not done this to yourself? by your forsaking the Lord your God when he led you in the way. Idolatry in the lives of brothers and sisters in Jesus, idolatry is not something that we set out to do, that we intentionally try to find, but it can happen when we have identified a person, we've identified an entity, a corporation, a provider, we've identified that as the source of supply that would, we think, remove the fear of rejection remove the fear of failure. And yet again and again and again, it disappoints us. Jesus will say, come to me, meaning you've got to leave where you've been. You've got to stop what you're doing. And drinking from those things and you've got to make your choice to come to me. Now, now folks, it's, it's, this, this is so important because when this, gets, when this gets straight in your marriage, it can lift the atmosphere off of, the atmosphere of oppression off of a marriage. Well, we're, we're going to the husband, or the husband's going to the wife, or we're going to each other. You, you, you got to fill this. You got to satisfy this. When the bottom line is nobody but Jesus himself can do that. So as long as I keep putting that pressure on a spouse, I bring into the marriage chaos. I bring into the marriage hopelessness. You know, I don't, I don't think this is 
all that rare. Most husbands, at most, you know, that's a relative term, but I'll use it anyway. Husbands can feel as if, by definition, they are inferior to their wives spiritually. That they're not going to pray like she prays, they're not going to sing like she sings, they're not going to mark the Bibles up like she marks the Bible. So, so basically, they're already feeling, you know, second class, B team, JV. <laughs> and, and, you know, Nick Saban had picked her as a starting quarterback in the house. When, but ladies, will you just please understand, and I'm going to make sure the guys hear this too, that will, you just, will you just understand that he, he may already have the sense that he's inadequate. And when you come to him and you put on him the pressure of being the Apostle Paul in the home, you know, or John the Baptist, and, and, and he's just trying to keep his mouth clean from work and the junk, it can shift, it can can change today, it can change before you leave the pew or the chairs this morning. If you will acknowledge he's a man and I love him and he's a good husband in many ways, but he is not God. Therefore, to apply to him godlike requirements is foolish for you as a wife. It doesn't mean the standard shouldn't be high. Yes. So, can I, can I go to the other side of the aisle, lest half of you just walk out? Was this part to see? The husbands, if your attitude is. She, she, she knows, has a sense, sort of, what I'm going through at work and the pressures that are coming against me and those kinds of things that they come in. And so, so I have a right to come home wallowing in my self-pity of how hard the day's been and just sort of slither up the steps to the front door with my thirsty heart saying, meet my needs to her. Satisfy this th- For both of us, male, female, only Jesus, only Jesus has the power, has the ability, knows how to satisfy your thirsty soul. He's not, listen, he's not going to rewrite the rules for your marriage. He's not going to rewrite the rules for this culture in this situation in which we find ourselves. And he says, here's a hope. If anybody's thirsty and what you've been chasing hadn't satisfied your thirst, where you've been taking your pitiful little thirsty cup hasn't been satisfied anywhere, you bring that to me, to me, to me. And I will cause there to be rivers of living water to flow out through your soul. Now, there are things spoken of, the life of the Spirit, the understanding of the things of the Spirit that the Lord would want us to know as He renews our minds and fills us up with the truth of who we are in Him. But i got to tell you, If you're taking your pitiful little thirsty soul always to people, always to something, to speak into you that which will satisfy your soul, you may seldom, if ever, hear the voice of the Spirit speaking to you because the Spirit will speak in agreement with the pursuit of Jesus. Do you see that? There can be all kinds of things that are true about you, but I'm not getting it because I keep taking my pitiful little thirsty soul to this and this and this and never to that. So along those lines, 
Let me read you what the one who satisfies thirst says about who you are. This is, this is the one who is able to make these truths vibrate in your soul. But it takes him to make them. This is Ephesians 1. This is out of the Passion Translation. Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm has already been lavished upon us as a love gift from our wonderful Heavenly Father, the Father of our Lord Jesus, all because He sees us wrapped into Christ. This is why we celebrate Him with all our hearts. And in love, He chose us. Who chose us? God Almighty, who could have chosen anybody, anything, but He chose us. Hallelujah. He chose us before he laid the foundation of the universe. Because of his great love, he ordained us so that we would be seen as holy in his eyes with an unstained innocence. But it was always in his perfect plan to adopt us as his delightful children through our union with Jesus, the anointed one, so that his tremendous love that cascades over us would glorify His grace for the same love He has for the beloved Jesus He has for us. And this unfolding plan brings Him great pleasure since we are now joined to Christ. We, we have been given the treasures of redemption by His blood, the total cancellation of our sins all because of the cascading riches of His grace. The super, super abundant grace is already powerfully working in us, releasing all forms of wisdom and practical understanding. But if you're trotting, I'm prone to it too. If we're trotting the thirsty places of our hearts for significance, for for a sense of worth, for the sense that we won't just be one big failure all our lives. If I'm trotting this to people and things, my ears can be deaf to what the Spirit of Jesus really wants you to know and hear. So, <laughs> if you hadn't left yet, this may get you. So what is it when we do this to some other place, some other person besides Jesus? Idolatry. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. If I have a two-legged something that I'm taking the need, the thirst of my heart to, and, and I'm banking on that one, that thing, that setting to satisfy that which only the Lord can satisfy. That, in reality, can become idolatry in a life. What, what happens when idolatry would, or what happened when idolatry would, would take over the nation of Israel and, and eventually judgment came, but famine would hit. The, the favor of the Lord, the sense of the Lord's presence would lift off the land and it would quit raining. And, and when it would go further, there would be protection that would be lifted because the Lord is jealous for our hearts. There can be times in believers' lives when we know tons of Scripture. We've got all kinds of pages and notebooks of journals and so forth, but we find ourselves in a place of spiritual drought, famine maybe. When those seasons hit, folks, and, and, and none of us are immune to the possibility of that happening, 
But, but, in, but instead of us trying to trot to the latest place where the greatest, latest preacher is or where the worship place, to ask the question, Lord, would you show me where there is any form of idolatry working in my heart that would cause you to lift the blessing of your favor? It could be a spouse. It could be a child. It could be a grandchild. It, it could be the place of work. It, it could be any number of things, but I'm taking the thirsty part of my heart to a place or to a person. D does that mean that we, we exit the human race? Does that mean that we don't work with our hands in companies and so forth? No, it doesn't mean that. But what it does mean is when you let people be people, you're going to be a whole lot nicer to those people. The pressure's off. They're not having to be God. You don't have such a standard here that requires perfection on every level. You've lost that. You've seen that as sin, sin. And you're taking your thirst to the only perfect, only all-powerful loving source, the exalted Jesus. And from that place, you get satisfied. You get satisfied so that you can work better, you can work harder, you can work as, as you, in the place where you are. But that doesn't, that's not your God. That can blow up tomorrow and you still know you're fine because he's got you. And the same in relationships. So last night, as the University of Texas Longhorn, were thumping the University of Alabama people in Tuscaloosa, mind you. A miracle of the sort, football-wise, of the Red Sea party. I've just lost some of you and catch you later. But as I was sitting there watching that, a few hours before I was in HEB, and I was... <laughs> I was walking down one of my favorite parts of our H-E-B, the ice cream aisle. So I started, I started on the east, and I was moving to the west, and all of a sudden, something just jumped up, gave me a revelation as I looked over there, and I saw there were only two buckets left of Southern Blackberry Cobbler Bluebell ice cream. I knew, and I told Shirley later, they're going to take it off the market. Summer's coming to an end. we got to make the most of that purchase now. <laughs> so I knew I had to act. And I went and grabbed one of those things and just nursed it, held it to my bosom as I went out in the heat, didn't want it to melt a drop. Football game started. So I went in and got a cup, just one cup, about that big, but it <laughs> pulled that ice cream out of that freezer, dipped that thing in there, and packed it. You got to pack it. <laughs> got to pack it. And I packed that rascal. Got me a tablespoon, not a teaspoon. <laughs> and I sat there, and I was trying to cheer those longhorns on. And, I ate my way through, and the minute I, I looked down there, and just it had vaporized. It had just, it was just gone. I'm not even sure where all it went, but it was, it was the cup was empty. So I got back up and went back in a second time and opened the drawer. I didn't pack it quite as full this time, but it was still respectably full. And I sat there, finished that one off. Longhorns went ahead and won. But I got to tell you, I was so full of what deeply satisfied the longings of my stomach that if you had walked through with a whole shopping rack cart full of more of that ice cream, I'd have said, I'm full. I don't need any more. I don't need any more. Now, I know some of you have said, Pastor, what in the world are you talking about? Jesus will save you 
by satisfying you. When you take the cup of a thirsty heart to Jesus and, and, and nowhere else has it been lastingly satisfied, he doesn't change your shoe size. He doesn't give you different color eyes. He won't give you another known language to speak or to write. He just has the ability to down deep in the deepest places of who you are satisfy you. I chose you. I adopted you. My blood paid for you. I've been raised up, seated in the heavenly places, and I have called you to join me in those heavenly places. You are chosen, picked out, wanted, and there are things that I have foreordained for you, arranged ahead of time for you to do, because you're a masterpiece of my grace. You will not fail in that which I have called you to do. So, when that's flowing, the knuckleheads can keep being knucklehead. The, the ones who have never given you approval that you keep saying, if they just approve me, if they just approve me, it won't matter to you anymore because your heart is satisfied. So how thirsty are you? Does it mean that we give up on those relationships? Does it mean that we don't have, have any more connection? No. It just means that the perspective is different now. A husband not coming to his wife saying, meet my needs, meet my needs, meet my needs, meet my needs, because if you don't meet my needs, I'm toast. The wife saying to the husband, be perfect, be perfect, be perfect, be perfect, love me perfectly. When he can't, when she can't, and in relationships with Christians, brother, Christian brothers and sisters, they're wonderful Christian people, but they are lousy gods. And what the Lord would do in the Old Testament days is he would work to prove the frailty of the idols. He would work. He would, he, he would move to cause the people to understand they can't even talk. They don't have any life in them. <laughs> then Elijah, let your fire fall, Lord. Let your fire fall. Mount Carmel on that day, that awesome story of those false priests and so forth and beating themselves up turned him into bloody pulp, cried out all day long. At one point, Elijah, <laughs> and this doesn't come out in your English translation, but this is literally, maybe he's gone to the bathroom. That's what it says, maybe Elijah. Maybe he's gone to the bathroom. And he used even cruder words than that. But then he said, Lord, will you show these people who you are and your power and your might. And it says the fire of God fell, consumed the sacrifices, the water that had been poured out on the sacrifices, and so forth. He defeats idols. He, th that's why these relationships and the way that they're configured at this point aren't working. It, it may be that if the Lord got his, had his way in there, it would turn into something wonderful. But right now, when it has become the place you take your heart, it's destined to disappoint. But the good news is, when we hear this, when we hear this, <laughs> the Lord say it, and I feel like there can be a bunch of us saying, Lord, I, I don't... I didn't realize I was doing that. I didn't, I didn't know. But what I do know is I keep being disappointed. In, in the deepest place of my heart, being satisfied by these people or this person. So, Lord, whatever this means, I want to get there. I, I want to be drinking from you. Taking the deepest part of who I am, who you fashioned me to be. <laughs> Instead of giving it to a lesser God, I want to give this to you. 
He says, come to me, keep coming to me, keep coming to me, keep coming to me, and keep drinking and keep drinking. As long as there's thirst and whatever thirst reappears, you, you, you keep making that trip. Can I give you four steps in that process? If you care to step into this with me, number one, and don't do them quickly, number one, confess the sin. Confess the sin of making an idol out of your spouse, an idol out of your grandchild, an idol out of your children, an idol out of your work. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. If we call it what God's called, Jesus didn't come to die for excuses, he came to die for sins. That's the only place we find forgiveness. Again, it doesn't mean we don't love them, it just means that we're not going to them for our affirmation and and the sense that we're accepted and rejected we quit that we call that sin i'm going there instead of going to you lord i haven't even spent any time reading what your word says i am to you confess it as sin confess it as sin secondly renounce all agreement with me the confessing of sin has to do with the past and in the present when i've done it but, but this renouncing means, Lord, by your spirit, I'm never going back there again. I'm setting my husband free. I'm setting my wife free. I'm setting my children free. I'm, set, I, I'm, not, I'm not putting this stuff on them anymore. Renounce it. Renounce it. Now, folks, I'm not talking about how to just make your life a little better. I'm talking about freedom that the Lord wants to give you. So, so trinketing this, just a little bit, nah, 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 that won't work. That won't work. But where the Spirit brings the conviction, it's the sin of idolatry, to put something or somebody in the place of satisfying the depth of my soul other than Jesus. Sin. I renounce it. But then to recognize, too, that Satan knows you, knows me, and he's the one who will press rejection. He'll press the sense of failure. He'll press all of these things. He keeps working that, and, and he'll never have you, he'll never encourage you to do this. He'll always encourage you to keep trying people. Well, that didn't work. That's why, you know, one marriage breaks up because we've got two ticks and no dog, but one of those ticks is still hunting, hunting somebody. He's still trying to get somebody to fill that deepest part. So, Resist the enemy. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I've confessed this is sin, and I resist Satan's place, his attempt to lie to me, to deceive me, to steal my inheritance from me in my relationship with Jesus. And fourth, take your cup to Jesus. The thirsty place, the disappointed place, the place that you're most prone to feel like you are weak and disappointed. Take that thirst because it is, it is a fear. It, it, you're, you're, you're taking to people the resolution of a fear instead of taking to Jesus, the one who Paul would say he hadn't given us the spirit of fear. He's given us the spirit of love and of power and of a sound mind. Folks, if we keep drinking from human wells, we're going to smell like, talk like, think like, be like human wells that we drink from. But if our thirst is this way, we're looking this way, that's when that flow of the life of the Lord can happen. You say, well, Pastor, I don't, I don't, I, I don't have a church job. I, I, I have a full-time duty. I'm doing this. Thing. Just, he is where you are. Stop making that as an excuse. I'm just telling you. Do you get in your truck? You get you sit behind your desk. You do whatever you do, and you say, "And Lord, I thank you for this job, but I'm declaring today this job does not own me. 
This is not my source. You are my source. I'm grateful for the friendships. I'm grateful for the marriage. I'm grateful for the relationships. But, Lord, I'm saying back to you and declaring to you as I work through my day that you are my source. They are not the source of satisfying my soul. They can't do it. Folks, this is why some people don't want to be around you. Because you're so needy and you keep coming to them with this empty cup. Satisfy me, satisfy me. Folks, the word gets out. You can't help them. And even if you could, they might not receive it. So take an inventory. If you put pressure on people that people are not supposed to have, quit it. If it, it's not, well, they just don't care about me. They just care about me. What if they really do care about you, but you, your needs are so exponential, and you're decla- declaring that they've got to meet those needs that they just check out. They just give up. I can't help. <laughs> Surely. You know, she's had to do it. She's had to do it. Because this fallen part of me could keep coming to her and saying, you know, here I, here I am. Help me. To which it really has made me grow up. When in trying to do that with a wife of 45 years or whatever, 47 years, I guess, where she just started doing this, meaning, I can't help you. It, it, it made me realize she didn't want to be an idol. <laughs> she wouldn't contribute to my idolatry. I needed to go this way. And I'm telling you, there's a measure of freedom, I think, that's, right? <laughs> the, there is a measure of freedom working in our home, right? Yeah. I think so. I think she'd say that. So we long for that for you. Rivers of living water instead of parched ground in your heart. Where are you going to get it? Not from people, but from Jesus. Would you stand with me, please? going to sing as we close this time together that wonderful simple chorus there's something about that name the name Jesus the name means his name means savior deliverer rescuer he's still doing that so where do you and I need his deliverance where do we need his rescue where do we need his satisfying the empty places of our heart. It's in those very places that he wants you to know it's not a person. It's not a people. It's Jesus. So Lord, show us how to do this. Show, show, us, show, us, show us how to take our thirst to you. And Lord, will you check us at the minute we're doing it the old way, the minute we're going to somebody else, tell me I'm okay, tell me I'm okay, tell me I'm okay. Check us when we're doing that. And turn our hearts unto you. Folks, there, there are people that the Lord may want to bring into your life. There'll be further things that the Lord may want to do through you. When he knows that you know, he's your source that you're not going to be sidetracked by somebody, something, because your eyes are on him. Amen. We learn the best lessons, isn't it the truth, by the hard places we go through? So, so if, if, if we're there, if that's where we are, in, in a place of finding ourselves consistently disappointed by the significant people in our lives, what if the Lord is saying, I want to show you something. It's not them, it's you. You come back to me. Grant it, Lord. Grant it, Lord. Grant it, Lord. Grant it, Lord. Amen. Amen. Our prayer partners are going to be here at the front, and please come if we can pray for you. Stand with you. Believe with you. 
And this isn't an automatic kind of thing. We have to have the Spirit helping us to do this because we've been done it the other way for so long that He has to do the change. He has to do the work. I just want to bless you, streaming family, ones in the house, for your prayers, for your support, for your encouragement, for your letters, for your notes, for your financial gifts. As you honor the Lord, He will honor you, and that's, that's His promise to us. Bless you. Bless you. I'm going to sing this wonderful chorus together. You come this way if we can pray for you. Streaming family, Pastor Walker at alamocity.org. Let us hear from you so that we can pray better for you and rejoice in the victories that he's bringing. Amen. Jillian, thank you.